The Pest and Predator podcast is brought to you by Field Heroes, powered by the Western Grains Research Foundation. Visit fieldheroes.ca to learn how beneficial insects can benefit your farm. Welcome to the Pest and Predator Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Haney, founder of realagriculture.com. Season four of the Pest and Predators Podcast. It is brought to you by Field Heroes, powered by the Western Grains Research Foundation. Visit fieldheroes.ca to learn how beneficial insects can benefit your farm. Today on the Pest and Predator Podcast, we're going to take a look back at some of the things that happened in 2022 and then look ahead to the 2023 growing season and what we can expect on the prairies when it comes to insect populations. To do that, we have an entomologist from each of the prairie provinces. We're going to hear from Dr. Shelley Barkley with Alberta Agriculture, Dr. James Tanzi from Saskatchewan Ministry of Agriculture, and Dr. John Gibbslowski with Manitoba Agriculture. Let's listen to what they have to say. Okay, today on the Pest and Predator podcast, let's dive into what happened in 2022 and really take that look ahead to the 2023 growing season. Let's bring in our panelists and get to the discussion up first. Uh, Jim, how are you doing today? I'm very well, thanks. How's it going? John, great to uh, see you again. Nice seeing you again, Sean. And Shelly, it's great to have you on the Pest and Predator podcast. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Sean. Thank you. Okay, Shelly, let's start with you. Let's take a look back at 2022 because that's always provides a bit of a perspective as we look at the year ahead. So from a from a 2022 perspective, what did it look like for pest and predators? Uh, any, any insect that was favored by uh, dry, warm weather, hot weather has been really successful. So uh, grasshoppers, uh, wheat stem sawfly, um, were probably some of the biggest things that we faced in mm. 2022. Let's hope until the 23 we break some of this, uh, at least the dry component. We'll take hot, but uh, some of the dry mm. component would be nice to uh, break. Jim in Saskatchewan, what were some of the highlights or maybe lowlights, I should put it, in, in terms of uh, pests and predators? Yeah, again, grasshoppers, uh, as Shelley mentioned, you know, animals that are that are favored by hot, dry conditions. Of course, we had uh, we had uh, some timely rains in May as well, uh, and that led to uh, an upregulation in our wheat midge populations uh, in some some parts of the province. Um, you know, despite a forecast for relatively low numbers in those areas, but yeah, of course, everything everything is tied to the precipitation with those ones. Lots of grasshoppers, especially in central and southern regions. Uh, flea beetle pressure was very high, uh, particularly in the uh, in the northeast uh, and eastern regions, and we saw an upregulation in pea leaf weevil populations in the northeast as well. Uh, on a plus side, we saw a retraction of cabbage seed bog weevil uh, populations. Uh, I, I suspect that's probably due to the dry conditions in 2021 uh, and poor host plant quality, but uh, again, that's speculation. And John, Manitoba saw a really kind of unique growing season, and the fact that it was a bit of a late start, but uh, things all worked out uh, for the you know pretty overall pretty good for for farmers. What happened in 2022 when it comes to pests? So you mentioned the late start, and that really did have a factor on some of our pest issues. Uh, the the big two that we had were flea beetles and grasshoppers. Those were by far the um, the, the dominant insect pest issues. Uh, we had. Uh, a lot of late earth seeding. Now, for some people that might have worked to their advantage, but we had um, situations where the canola was just sitting in the seedling stages for way too long in um, late May and early June in some fields. So we had a lot of foliar spraying going on in some reseeding because of flea beetles. Uh, the grasshoppers, we had a lot of later maturing crops, and uh, so there was some significant grasshopper damage in areas. Now, the one thing that was uh, maybe a little bit different than uh, we saw in some of the other prairie provinces, we had um, some aphids arrive that caused some damage in some of our crops. And this partially may be due to the later seeding that we had. So in soybeans, we had soybean aphid come in. Um, most of the spraying was happening in August. Uh, the soybeans were still in the, their vulnerable stages quite long. And same with the cereals, we had uh, both green peach, uh, sorry, um, bird cherry old aphid and English green aphid come in. Now, in most years by August, the crop is way too far advanced for the aphids to be an issue, but we had uh, some significant spraying for cereal aphids uh, this year as well, and also in peas, we had uh, mm -hmm. spraying for pea aphids. 
Every year, know, Purdue, sorry, sorry, go ahead, Jim. Uh, okay. No, I was just going to say we, we saw we, uh, similar issues in, uh, in Saskatchewan as well. Okay, let's let's take a look ahead here to 2023. Uh, Jim, let's start with you. Uh, what are you expecting when it comes to the population loads and some of the, the issues that farmers are going to have to be aware of when it comes to uh, pests and predators uh, for 2023? Well, I think the one that's the front of mind for everyone is grasshoppers right now. You know, given given the heavy populations that we saw in central and southern regions, I mean, John did mention the uh, you know the cool wet spring and the, and and uh, you know some of the delays, and that seems to have suppressed some of the grasshopper populations in eastern portions of, uh, uh, particularly northeastern portions of our of our uh, of Saskatchewan's growing regions. Uh, but we had uh, really terrific conditions for egg laying for grasshoppers in July and August, and really that's when it matters. Uh, so dry to very dry uh, conditions in central and southern regions, that and you know the, the, the correlation of that with, with really heavy populations. So a lot of opportunity for boy to meet girl and for those eggs to go into the ground, so. Does, the, does a cool, like we're, we're kind of looking here a bit of a late spring, Mm -hmm. <laughs> because mother nature just wants February to continue into April, it seems. Um, does that cool spring help us when it comes to grasshopper loads for the season? Uh, it can delay their development. They, they, they overwinter as eggs. So we, you know, in Saskatchewan, at any rate, we've got four primary pests and they all overwinter, like grasshopper pests, pardon me, and they all overwinter as eggs in a state that's, that's called diapause. So it's a, it's a state of arrested development and their development is, is, is dictated by temperature, but they, they can hunker down. Uh, they are they are native native to the prairies and uh, and pretty cold resilient so they can hunker down and wait for those warm temperatures um, the updated forecast for uh, for long term is is looking at some warmer temperatures so i mean they can speed through their development relatively quickly uh, resilient resilient buggers okay uh, well, shelly what, what are you expecting uh, i know a lot of farmers in southern alberta are very concerned about uh, grasshoppers but there's also uh, those pesky gophers as well. Well, gophers are out of my my purview. But I would expect we're going to see grasshoppers, just like Jim said, um, in southern Alberta, up the Saskatchewan-Alberta border. And in the piece, because it's a year ending in an odd number, I would expect that there may be some issues with Bruner's grasshopper in the piece. Um, this is hmm. grasshopper seems to follow a two-year life cycle so yeah an odd year in the alberta piece um means there could be some bruners there for sure okay and, and john what is manitoba looking at well the two that are a bit more predictable are the flea beetles and the grasshoppers uh, we've had chronic high flea beetle populations for several years and i just don't see that declining anytime soon so i think uh as advisable for a, uh, farmers and agronomists just to anticipate high flea beetle populations and do whatever they can to try to get uh, quick germination and quick early growth from the crop. Uh, grasshoppers, as was mentioned, um, we also had good egg laying conditions. We do do a survey late in the season. We uh, look at adult grasshoppers and what their numbers are like during that egg laying period. and. We had some, I'll say moderate and maybe some areas, high numbers last year. But as uh, uh, Jim mentioned, the conditions were very good for egg laying. So grasshoppers are certainly one that people have to have on their radar going into next year. Uh, the others are really hard to call because the aphids I mentioned, soybean aphid, as far as we know, doesn't overwinter in the Canadian prairies. Uh, and same with the English grain aphid and the oat bird cherry aphid, they're aphids that blow in. So you can have very different years back to back. Uh, P aphid uh, does overwinter somewhat, but when we do get big uh, problems with them, it's often that's augmented by populations that have blown in. So the aphids are a little bit harder to predict. And I'll just mention one more that uh, we dealt with a little bit last year, ligus bugs. Um, after several years where they really didn't make much of an appearance, we did have some spraying for ligus bugs last year and they can successfully overwinter in the Canadian prairies as well. So they're another one just to keep on our radar for next year. And, and are flea beetle populations just kind of like a given? Is that just, we expect it's, it at this point? 
<laughs> it's been that way for a while, actually. Uh, what was tricky with flea beetles was with some of the insects that we've covered, and we're, we're probably getting into this. We've got some good natural enemies that once the pest gets high, the natural enemies will build their populations, take the pest down. You get these cycles. Uh, we, we just haven't been seeing that type of cycling with flea beetles. There isn't really um, a parasitoid or a few key predators that seem to be able to take their populations down and they can overwinter well in the Canadian prairies. So yeah, they've been almost flatlined at high level for quite a while. Jim and Shelley, do you want to, do you have any comments about flea beetles? You know, <laughs> yeah. No, I, I just yeah you know, to, to 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 John's point. I mean, yeah, we 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 can count on relatively consistent pressure, and that's that's across the board. But I mean, we we can get some variability. I mean, you, we've seen heavy flea beetle populations across uh, canola growing regions in Saskatchewan. What's uh, what what was interesting from last year though was. Um, uh, as many many might be familiar with, we're, we're seeing a bit of a shift or a replacement of crucifer flea beetle with striped flea beetle in a lot of canola uh, canola growing regions, and that extends right down into the Dakotas. So, you know, regions that typically didn't have any striped flea beetle seem to be there seem to be straight moving in, uh, and the converse was actually uh, actually apparent last year in the Saskatoon area, uh, and. The suspicion is is that's associated with some of the hot dry conditions. So, striped flea beetle doesn't doesn't do as well in hot dry conditions as crucifer flea beetle and in the Saskatoon area of course it was very hot and dry in 2021 and that may have had a regulatory re regulating effect on the, on the straight flea beetles uh, with you know with the snowpack that we have this year I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see you know see what happens with the straight flea beetle population uh, we end and the moisture associated with that and the cool weather in the spring um, uh, stay tuned to this channel we'll uh, <laughs> so, and, and correct me if I'm wrong here, what, what I'm hearing is that even though it's been, you know, cold the end of March, bizarrely cold early April, if you're, if you're farming and thinking that this sort of, you know, insect issues for 2023 are over, it's going to, you know, this cold weather is going to kill them off and we're going to be fine. That is a false narrative. Absolutely. Yeah. They are, they are tough as nails. And, uh, Part of the reason that they are as tough as they are, animals who that live in this environment, is is uh, um, they, they use something called uh, uh, supercooling temperatures, or that is they have proteins and or alcohols that they that they produce in their bodies that reduce the freezing temperature of their blood, their hemolymph. Uh, and when you're talking about grasshoppers, I mean that can be very cold. You know, minus eighteen. Uh, we've got some invasives that are less tough, and pea leaf weevil and cabbage seed pod weevil are considerably less cold hardy than uh, than uh, some of the native species. But as a rule, yeah, they can they can really depress their freezing temperatures, and and uh, so it's not the cold that kills; it's crystal formation that mm -hmm. kills. And if they can stop that ice from forming in their bodies and you know tissue tissue disruption, then then Bob's your uncle. They're they're ready to go for the next season. So. Great. Okay. The other thing to keep okay. in mind there, Sean, is that uh, uh, we've got these super cold tolerant insects, but also beneath that snow, it's not all that cold. Mm -hmm. Right. So, uh, you know, even when, if it's still minus 20, say, uh, above the snow, you have a couple inches of snow on the ground, it's probably barely below freezing where they are. And as Jim mentioned, they can survive some pretty cold temperatures. So you almost need next to no snow and wickedly cold temperatures to kill some of these uh, pests. In the case of grasshopper eggs, you don't want conditions that will kill grasshopper eggs because you won't have any winter wheat surviving or alfalfa and things like that. So yeah, quite, for quite true. Oh, okay, in terms of, we're gonna get to, into some of the beneficials here in a second, just I wanna, from a, what farmers need to do same rules apply to all other years make sure as we're going through the growing season we're out there and we're scouting and we're sweeping and we're paying attention uh from a control perspective right shelly absolutely nothing replaces boots in the field like norm flurry says yeah you gotta be walking Nor those fields or walking the ditches even yeah yeah, absolutely. Okay, so let's talk about some of the friendly predators that, that farmers need to be on the lookout for as they go to manage their pests in 2023. Of course, Pest Predator Podcast, 
We've learned a lot about some of these beneficials that are working for you for free. The field heroes, as we call them. Uh, Shelly, let's start with you. Well, one of my one of my favorites is uh, Macro Glens, who does a pretty good job of looking after um, wheat midge. And in Alberta, we could be set up for some wheat midge in that um, area from sort of Edmonton East into Saskatchewan. So we're going to be counting on um, scouting, but also some of those macro glands coming along and helping us look after the population. John, how about you? So I'm going to pick one that we saw a lot of last year that was often misidentified, hoverfly larvae. Um, they look like slugs. And we saw a lot of this in our cereal crops and our pea crops, a little bit in the soybeans too, uh, growers and agronomists phoning, and what are these slugs all over my, slug-like things all over my crop? Well, they're hoverfly larvae, and they're there because you had lots of aphids. And they're, they're, they can be confusing because sometimes they're green, sometimes they're a brownish color, and other times they're almost a pinkish color very much slug-like. They've got a tapered end, which is their head end, and they've just got a hook for a mouth part. They'll impale an aphid, hold it up, suck the juice out, plop it back down, grab another one. They're actually blind and legless, um, but the, ad, the adults of hoverflies, which are very good bee and wasp mimics, a lot of people think they're a, a bee or a wasp, uh, they're attracted to the honeydew that aphids produce. So they know where the aphids are and they lay their eggs right in the aphid colonies. So when they hatch out their blind, legless, slug-like larvae, they're right in the aphid colonies and they just start picking off the aphids and devouring them. So much happening in that canopy. Okay, Jim, uh, what, what are you on the lookout for this year? Uh, one that we saw last year, it localized, but, uh, but pretty spectacular when it did occur was uh, Entomophthora grillii which is a fungal pathogen of grasshoppers. And there are different isolates of it. Uh, so some will, uh, you know, attack a, a one species of grasshopper, but not influence another. So you could have clear wing grasshopper right next to, uh, right next to two stripe grasshopper, which, you know, can occur uh, on a fairly regular basis. And all the two stripe are dying off without influ influencing the, the clear wing or vice versa. So you, you, you see both cases happening. So specific isolates of this fungus are, are going after specific species of, uh, of grasshopper. Uh, what the grasshopper does is, is, is oblige its host, the, or what the, the fungus, pardon me, does is oblige its host, the grasshopper, to climb to the top of a plant and grab on for dear life. And of course, the, their exoskeleton's a lot like a, like a suit of armor. And so that'll, that'll kind of lock into place. And, and so when they die, they're stuck on the top of the plant. And then that dead insect uh, is, a, is a source of fungal spore. So, all those fungal spores are going to rain down on all the grasshoppers' pals and infect them. Uh, so we saw some we saw some pretty significant populations of those uh, of Entomophthora outbreaks in grasshoppers. So I mean, you know, quarter sections of of of, uh, of crop, you know, littered with dead grasshoppers on the top that that apparently could be smelled from from a mile or two away. I mean, they're big meaty animals, so they do stink when they die. So especially in in, in numbers. Uh, so conditions that are that are conducive to thunderstorms, the you know fun, fungi like and humid, uh, there's something in that uh, that contributes to uh, to outbreaks of uh, of uh, Entomophthora and 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 you know influences or inflicts regulation on on grasshopper populations. John, I know you have another one you wanted to bring up too that is really super cool. So yeah, they're called aphid mummies, and you'll be able to identify them as a quote mummy because they, they look like an aphid that's somewhat inflated and the color isn't right. They're almost a, uh, a, a bronzy or brown color. Sometimes they can be black depending on the type of wasp that laid an egg into them. So what those aphid mummies are, they're actually, they have been a home for a wasp larva. And what happens in this case, you have a tiny little black wasp that is going around laying eggs right into the aphids. And when those wasp eggs hatch, the larva of the wasp uh, eventually it kills the aphid, and the aphid becomes a home for the wasp larva. It kind of inflates a little bit, becomes a nice home for this wasp larva. The wasp larva lives inside of the aphid, uh, eats its guts out, and eventually will exit the um, the aphid mummy. You'll see, and sometimes you'll even see a little hole 
in the aphid mummy where uh, the the aphid the wasp uh, emerged from the aphid mummy. At some years they can take out quite a bit of the aphid population. We saw them um, a lot in the peas last year. That's where it really stood out. Some of the pea fields people were noticing a lot. And I was getting the question from agronomists, we're starting to see a lot of this, but the aphids are above the economic threshold. What do we do? And it, it actually puts growers into a really real conundrum because they, they can see this uh, biological control happening, but they're still above threshold. Um, fortunately, we now have some selective insecticides that might help out in situations like that. But it, yeah, it really was quite noticeable in some fields last year. Fantastic stuff. Uh, looking forward to the 2023 growing season. And I'm sure that uh, whatever challenges in front of us when it comes to pests, we're uh, our, the research community and the grower is ready to tackle it with all the information. Great stuff here again in another episode of the Pest and Predator podcast. Uh, thanks so much to all three of you for joining us. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, thanks. Sean. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Pest and Predator podcast. It's brought to you by Field Heroes, powered by the Western Grains Research Foundation. Visit fieldheroes.ca to learn how beneficial insects can benefit your farm.